This is Real Estate Rookie episode 341. My name is Ashley Kerr, and I am here with my co-host, Tony J. Robinson. And welcome to the Real Estate Rookie podcast, where every week, twice a week, we bring you the inspiration, motivation, and stories you need to hear to kickstart your investing journey. And today, uh, you're definitely going to get a kick (laughs) to help you get started. Um, We've got Dan McDonald coming on to the podcast. And Dan, uh, I think, is a great example of how to get started as a real estate investor with a low-risk strategy in an expensive market. So if you check, if you want to check either of those boxes, you'll really love today's episode. Dan will go into how he was open with communication and involving his then girlfriend, now wife, into the house hacking experience as they toured different properties and finally purchased their first house hack. And so as of this recording, they have had two house hacks. So he is going to share how he was able to make that possible within two years of purchasing those two properties. He also talks about the renovation on them, how he funded them, how um, he found them, and other things that you need to know if you are going to house hack. At the very end of the episode, one of the last questions we ask him is, what are the tips that you would advise someone who wants to get started in house hacking? That, if anything, is the must listen to of this episode. Last thing I love about Dan, and and you'll hear this, is uh, why he's not necessarily planning to quit his job anytime soon, and maybe what you can learn from that. So really great episode. Excited to get uh, to it with you guys now. Uh, If you guys haven't yet, please do just take a few minutes out of your day and leave us an honest rating and review on whatever platform it is you listen to the podcast. If you're on YouTube, if you're on Apple Podcasts, uh, the more reviews we get, the more folks we're able to reach. And honestly, like the more folks we can reach, the more folks we can help find deals just like Dan did, right? He listened to Craig's podcast episode, the new read Craig's books, and now he's doing this thing himself. So the work that we're doing here on the Ricky show really is changing lives and we can reach more people when you leave that rating review. So take a few minutes, do that for us, please. And also something else really exciting for Tony and I, our real estate partnerships book has released on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and other bookstores throughout the world. So if you have purchased our book, we would love for you to leave us a review on whichever platform you bought it from, the Bigger Packets bookstores or from Amazon, Barnes and Noble, et cetera. And thank you to all that have purchased it. We've heard uh, great feedback so far and really, really appreciate it when you guys share that with us. Dan, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us today on Real Estate Rookie you start off telling us a little bit about yourself and how you got started in real estate. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you both so much for having me. Uh, definitely excited to be here. Uh, so yeah, my name is Dan. I currently live uh, about 30 minutes north of Boston. Um, so pretty expensive market to say the least. Um, but yeah, I've been, uh, been house hacking for almost four years at this point. Um, have two duplexes, uh, up here and, uh, it's just been a great experience so far. I still have my, my W2. I'm not really in any, uh, immediate rush to leave that. Honestly, I'm, I'm one of the few that kind of seems like, you know, I, w- I want to reach five for sure, but like, I want to reach it while I'm at my W2 and hopefully still happy with that. And then just kind of pile it all on. Dan, what is your W2? Does it translate to real estate at all? Uh, unfortunately it doesn't really. Um, so I have my master's in marketing research and, um, it, it gets confused a lot with like actual marketing, but it's, it's legit like the studies behind it more. So like, I'm not really, like, I don't create any campaigns or anything. Like everyone will do that for me, like, or like design like something. And then I'm getting the research on it. So I'm the guy with like the surveys and like data analysis and stuff like that. So Helps to look at numbers. Um, yeah, find information on property. Yeah, analyze a market. I feel like it'd probably be pretty useful with your uh, skill set. Yeah, set. I do work with one company. I'm not allowed to say which one, but a, a, a pretty mm-hmm. pretty big home improvement company that I uh, get to. I definitely spend a lot of time myself there. So it's like, oh, I kind of know why you guys are thinking this stuff, or man, I should suggest <laughs> something else. So uh, yeah, it is yeah. helpful. Dan, I want to ask, you said that, that you, you house hack and, you know, this is the, the rookie podcast for, so for folks that maybe aren't familiar with the phrase house hacking, uh, what is that strategy and maybe give some insights into why you chose that as your investment vehicle? Yeah. So house hacking, um, it's the reason I love it so much is it's basically taking 
you know, property and essentially living in part of it and renting out the other part. But you can be so creative on what that actually means. So for me, it means a duplex. Uh, my wife and I live in a unit, rent the other side. Um, but I mean, there's, you know, you could buy a single family rent by the room. You could buy, you know, a single family and build like a detached, you know, garage apartment or something like there's just so many options. It really depends on like how creative you want to be and, and how uncomfortable you want to be sometimes too. Um, but we, my wife and I definitely took the traditional route of, you know, duplex. We completely live in one unit with no roommates and then, you know, downstairs is, is, a rental unit. Uh, so we feel like we kind of have our own space, which was a big, uh, important factor for convincing her. Just one, one follow up for you, Dan. Um, like I guess why was house hacking maybe the, the strategy that you chose? Because there, there are pros and cons to it and you touched on it a little bit. Um, what are some of the pros you see? What are some of the cons you see? And, and ultimately what made you choose house hacking as, as a strategy for you? Yeah. So, um, I definitely got to give credit where credit's due. Uh, I originally heard of house hacking through Craig Kerlop. Um, I was actually in Craig's fraternity in college. Um, (laughs) so we both went to school in Boston and knew him, uh, knew him for a little while before he graduated. And, um, you know, like you do with all like kind of people in like your fraternity or whatever, like, you know, from college, like follow them on Facebook and you see what they're doing and stuff. And I could see Craig, like, starting to build up like this real estate empire. And then I saw him working for bigger pockets and I'm like, what is this company? And then I just went right into the rabbit hole and was like, (laughs) oh man, and like started to hear more and more about it and then read his book and stuff. So for me, it was really like, and I still really believe this, that it's, it's the easiest point of entry for, you know, rookie, uh, you know, real estate investors. It's like you, for me, uh, the, the prices are just insane around here. So it's very hard to like for me to come up with 20% on a, you know, quarter of a million dollar house or or more is going to take me some serious time. Um, so for this, it was, okay, like, how do I get something? How do I stop paying rent and, and build an asset and start to build this business without literally waiting 20 years or something to save up the 150 or $200,000? So for me, that was really the main focus was I need a place to live no matter what. So I'm already paying expensive rent. Why can't I be paying myself? Why can't someone else be paying me? So it was really just that point of entry that I think is to this day is is definitely the easiest route to start off. I just want to mention real quick that Craig Curlop was a guest on here too, the Rookie Podcast. He was episode 195. And you did mention his book, Dan, which is The House Hacking Strategy, which is available on biggerpockets.com and in the bookstore. If anyone wants to check that out after they hear Dan talk about all the amazing benefits of house hacking and want to get started themselves. (laughs) So let's kind of go into that that first deal of, okay, you've decided you want to do house hacking. What are the next initial steps you took what made you actually start investing compared to maybe somebody who says, yes, I want to start house hacking and then never takes action. Explain those steps for us. Yeah, I think what's really important. Um, well, for me, one of the biggest first steps was convincing my wife. Well, my now wife back then, she was my um, fiance or girlfriend at the timing. I can't com- exactly remember, but she was definitely close to me. <laughs> Your yeah, girl. She was my girl. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that was definitely set in stone. So convincing her for sure, because, uh, you know, we both grew up the same way, but like she never heard of this real estate. Wasn't like her go to like, she doesn't, she's still like, she sees the benefits, but she's not mm-hmm. obsessive like I am. So, you know, convincing her like, this is what we would do for here. And like, this is why it's better versus like that traditional starter home that everyone wants to buy. And then they become house poor and it just seems to drag on and on. So that was definitely step one for me. Um, but really too, I had to understand my finances. I had to understand, you know, what it looked like for me to house hack around here. Cause obviously if you're house hacking North of Boston or in Boston or whatever, Massachusetts in general, it's a much different ball game than, you know, maybe Tennessee or Georgia or whatever. So I really had to study my surroundings and understand like, okay, what, are, what markets, you know, should I be focused in? What's actually realistic for me? Cause obviously I would love to house hack and get paid to do so, but is that realistic like around Boston? Dan, I, you, you, you hit on something that uh, I'm sure catch like, like caught the attention of many of our listeners. And you said that you were able to get your, your fiance on board with, with this idea of house hacking. 
I, me personally, I think house hacking is probably one of the hardest strategies to, to get like a spouse on board with, because at least with like non house hacking type investments, you're not sharing walls with your, <laughs> with your like real estate, uh, investment itself, right? Like you there's a little bit of separation there, but with house hacking, like, you know, you've got one side, your, your tenants are on the other side. So what, what steps did you take, Dan? Uh, and, and kind of what was that journey like for you and your, your fiance at the time to get her from maybe knowing nothing about real estate investing to saying, yes, let's move in next door to our tenants. Like, like what was that conversation like? Yeah. So one of the bigger things, uh, I mean, not to make it a marriage podcast, but definitely compromise. I mean, definitely realize that like, you know, cause she's putting up her money too. And, and there is a little bit of that trust there. That's a little bit of blind trust. And she'll admit it too. Like she, she will support me. She will trust me. She trusts that I have put in all this effort to study this and listen to a million podcasts and I can run the numbers and stuff. So definitely, definitely show her you're serious, show him or her you're serious about this and then bring them along for as much as they want to be. So I brought her to every, every open house. I wasn't going to buy a house without her ever seeing it. We, we went to every open house together. I communicated with her, you know, the types of things we need to look for, the types of things we need. And to be completely honest, I don't know if she ever really was a hundred percent there until we got our, our first duplex and we were able to see a, the numbers and, and how much sense it made financially, but also build a place that was actually better for us. Um, cause it, we essentially had to do a lot of cosmetic stuff to it and it was nicer than what we were living in before. So some of those updates weren't the most like you know, financially savvy thing I've ever done, but it was like, okay, what will make her excited about living here? I want to get her into a place that for rental wise, people are going to love it, but she's going to love it too. And she's going to want to live here. And I think that's really important. I mean, if you're telling your partner, like you're going to live in the basement together and then someone's going to rent out a beautiful upstairs, then good luck. And if you find that person, maybe you should marry them because they're very, <laughs> they are very, uh, very willing at that point. But my wife, you know, God bless her. She supports me, but she's not, she's not looking, you know, to live behind a curtain like Craig did for a while. So, uh, you know, you gotta, you gotta tread lightly. Dan, you, you hit on some important things that I, I want to make sure that we're highlighting for, for every single person that's listening. This is something I've been saying for a while now, but if, if you have a goal of investing in real estate and your spouse is not on board, the first question you need to ask yourself is, have I earned that person's trust? Have I earned the right to get my spouse to be on board with this desire that I have to invest in real estate? Because if you've never really put your mind towards anything in your entire life, why would your spouse or your, your girlfriend want to get on board or your boyfriend want to get on board with this idea? If you've jumped around from a different business idea every 30, 60, 90 days and none of them have seen any level of success, why would they think that this one will be any different? But what you said, Dan, was she trusted you because A, uh, she saw that you, you poured in a bunch of time into educating yourself, going listening to the podcast, reading the books. She knows that you have the analytical skill set. So there's already some natural ability that you have uh, to be successful in this. And then the third thing you did was you, you involved her in the process, right? Like, hey, we went to every single open house together. So you, you built the foundation of trust by yourself and then you slowly brought her in. And I think that's the path that people should take when they're trying to get their, their partner or their spouse on board with real estate investing. My cousin, she just got engaged yesterday, actually. And when she started dating her boyfriend, he owned a duplex. And, you know, after a year dating, she moved in with him and she was just complaining, like, we need a bigger place. Like, I don't have a closet, all this stuff. And I said, what are, you, what are your plans this weekend? And she named, like, two places. They were going out to dinner. They were going to, I don't know, a concert, something. And I was like, what trips do you have planned? And she's planning all these trips. And I was like, do you enjoy that? Do you love all that? And she's like, yeah, I do. And I said, do you know why you can do that? <laughs> and she's like, well, my boyfriend pays for me. And I said... Yeah. Do you think he could pay for that if he has this huge house mortgage now? Like, yeah. and she was like, oh, yeah, like it clicked with her. <laughs> and now she, she yeah. just got engaged in Scotland and they just bought this beautiful, you know, huge house and everything. And it was that delayed gratification that she mm -hmm. had to suffer and live in a, you know, a small little apartment and have a tenant downstairs for a couple of years. But, um, it, it, it is remarkable, like what can actually happen. And, you know, it may not seem like, 
that much, but it actually can add up to a lot down the road. It's almost like you think of compound interest. It's all these compounding effects of house hacking and be able to cut those living expenses out can really add up in the the long run to save Mm -hmm. for that big, beautiful diamond ring she got. (laughs) Ash, I I just got to add one thought to that. Like, I, I feel like part of the reason that delayed gratification is so difficult is it has a lot to do with the community that you find yourself in. Mm-hmm. Um, so when, you know, my, my son, he's almost 16 now, but, uh, we, we were one of the late ones to, to give him a cell phone, like a smartphone. And, uh, when we first gave him a cell phone, he had one of those like old school Nokia's like they, they still make them, but they're like newer versions. And he was so embarrassed, uh, about using that cell phone that if he had to call us, he would go into the stall in the restroom <laughs> to, to make the <laughs> phone call. Um, like I could hear the echo of the bathroom whenever we talked to him and, there, the reason I bring that up is because he was he was so embarrassed to use that cell phone because everyone else at the school already had like the cool iPhone or whatever it was. So he was like the 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 red herring or, or the the one that, that was left out in that group. But imagine if everyone in his junior high was also using that same cell phone, it wouldn't be that big of a deal, right? So it, the same thing happens for us as adults. We get so influenced by the people that are around us that if no one else is practicing delayed gratification, if everyone else is spending today and thinking about tomorrow second, it becomes harder for us to kind of develop the, the right skills set ourselves. So for all of our rookies that are listening, I think a, a very important next step for all of you is building that community, is, is integrating yourself with people who are going on the journey that, that you're trying to go on. So that way, doing weird things like living, you know, maybe not as weird as Craig about like living behind a, a curtain in the, in the living room or whatever, but, you know, doing these weird things that real estate investors do to achieve these long-term goals, it becomes easier when everyone else is doing it with you. Okay. So Dan, let's talk about your why. Like, why did you want a house hack? Like, what was your end goal for my cousin? It was, you know, the big, beautiful house at the end of the road and the diamond ring. Um, you know, for Tony, it was his son to finally get an eye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, for me, my why, you know, it definitely plays a lot into my background. So I grew up um, you know, in a, a small like farm town in Connecticut, um, middle class, like um, two very loving and supportive parents. You know, my my dad really instilled like this this notion in me of like a strong worth ethic and you know all his financial savviness. And you know, he was a great saver um, and worked extremely hard. And because of that, he was able to retire at, at fifty years old. But this was after working, you know, two jobs for 30 years that he absolutely hated. Um, you know, so for him, it was, you know, he had this very admirable work ethic and I can't take that away, but it was a lot more like working harder versus working smarter. And, you know, and that's, that's essentially like in his eyes was the only way to do it. You know, I'll just work, 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 and then, you know, I'll be able to save and then I'll retire. But, you know, and he would tell me all the time too, like, it's not what you make, it's what you save. And, you know, up until a few years ago, I was like, I really held on to that idea tightly that like, if I just work as hard as I possibly can, if I just save as much as I can, I'll be fine. And I'm not saying that's like the wrong way. Um, but, you know, it wasn't until he he passed away a couple of years ago and it just was like this total wake up call for me. Uh, you know, it was just, you know, he he died within a year of being diagnosed with cancer and he was only 60 years old. So you know, that's, that's, that's so young that, you know, that's, and, and I was yeah. so thankful for everything that he'd done for, you know, my family and me. And I was really happy that he got to experience retirement for as long as he did. Cause I mean, most people don't even retire by 60 anymore. So, but it was just like this eye opening moment where it was like, okay, how, how can I work? How can I work smarter? How can I stop, you know, being obsessed with working harder? And real estate was always something he wanted to do. And I mean, he got his license, you know, when when he was uh, my age, but he never did anything with it. You know, he'd always look at listings on Zillow, always make us drive by every house for sale on vacation. Like, even when he had the means to, he didn't do it. Like, he never took that initial step. So for me, it was like, I swore to myself that I wasn't going to let all the lessons I'd learned from him passing away be for nothing and result in nothing. So I swore I would take that and, you know, make it, make it 
you know, the lowest point of my life, turn it into the escalator, you know, for my success and really just focus on, okay, I want to do all the things he did for his family. I want to, I want to give them education. I want to be there. I want to support them. I want to help them, you know, but I want to, I want to change it up a little bit and just focus more on, on working smarter and not necessarily harder. And I struggled with that like my entire life. I still do. I mean, I'm still trying to get away from this mentality that if I just work harder, it'll automatically lead to more success. But I know that's not the case. You know, it's like it doesn't always work out that way. So that's for me has really been like, you know, I like I love my job. I don't have any plans to leave it. But how do I still get all the things I want without relying on any one source of income? And just, you know, focusing on working smarter and not harder. Yeah, that's great. I think that people get caught up in like, I have to leave my job because that means you're financially free and you made it in real estate. But that that's not really the case. What the goal is oftentimes, and you do, may not even realize it, but it's just that you have the freedom to do whatever you want. So if you just all of a sudden wake up one day and decide you want to leave your W-2, you can do that. It's that freedom that allows you to make these life decisions day to day that aren't based on money. Is that your real estate is funding your life that you can make those decisions and not have to worry about money, which for a lot of Americans, that is a huge impact on every decision they make every day, what their finances are, are leads to a lot of the decision making. And imagine taking that factor out where there's so many day-to-day decisions that you can now make without even having to think of the financial impact. For example, here's just like something that is a very small realm. Your, Your son is sick. You have to take off the day of work to go pick up your son from school. Maybe you have a job where you're a waitress, you get paid, you know, from tips and now you are missing a full day's pay where you're not making anything. Or there's a lot of jobs where you don't have sick time or paid time off or things like that. And you really have to, and even if you do, you really have to pick and choose which days you're going to use those, that certain time off and things like that. But imagine not having to even think about that implication and just being like, Oh, okay, I'm not going to do any work today. I'm just going to go get my son from school and, or maybe you can work from home, whatever that may be. But that is just like a huge revelation is once you like realize that you can make decisions not based on money, how much freedom you actually have to kind of pursue the life that you want. So Dan, let's get into your, your first property then. So you and you and your girl are out touring houses and everything and you finally pick one out. Run us through the numbers on that. Yeah. Um, so the first property was a duplex. Uh, it was a, a two one, um, on each unit up, up, upstairs and downstairs. And, um, we actually didn't get it the first time. So this was listed for 475 and we, uh, we went in at 501 and we didn't get it. And this was literally a couple weeks before the world shut down for COVID. Uh, so we'd been like searching and hunting for months now, you know, putting in offers and getting blown out of the water. And we get a call like literally as the world shut down that week, uh, you know, March 2020, that the guy who actually got accepted lost his job and that he was pulling out of the deal. And if we wanted it, it was ours. So it was a very scary decision because I was like, well, it doesn't look too great right now to own something or like, I just don't, like, we don't know, like we could lose our jobs tomorrow. Like, do we really want to buy something for, you know, half a million dollars? Um, but I knew like, I knew the numbers. I knew I needed to just jump in. Um, and that, you know, like I just, I, I, I just had to jump in. Like there was no other option for me. Just, just get after it and I would figure it out no matter what. So I guess uh, a couple questions to drill down on there. Um, so this this property was it was four seventy five, but you initially offered five hundred one. Why was that? Like why why go over asking price? And the reason I ask this question, Dan, is because I, I think for a lot of rookies, any time that they that they think of going over asking, they feel that they're overpaying. And it's a common misconception, but I'm just curious. Like, why did you come in at 501 when, when the asking price was 475? Yeah, so I was going for the Price is Right style, you know, just putting that one extra dollar <laughs> than the person on my left and hoping it worked out. But for all I know, that guy could have put 502. But, um, you know, for me, it wasn't... 
we we knew like i i had spent the time running the numbers and knowing what would work and obviously if i got it for less of course numbers would have been better but i knew exactly kind of what i could offer and i also had a lot of trust in my agent and i definitely think that's super important like find an agent who's house hacking or has house hacked or you know knows that stuff very well because my agent not only knew the area knew the market knew what was realistic you know he he wasn't going to say put in 450 like you know you, you don't stand a chance we we had known we had seen the market been playing out for very you know everyone was going over asking price it was impossible i mean there was one of the houses we looked at went 100,000 over asking price not something i was going to bid on but you know we just knew what to expect our expectations were more realistic than you know some people who just assume that they can get in a house and and like like oh that asking price I can totally get it for you know 50 grand less or whatever and that wasn't the case and for me my strategy 100% is buy and hold so even if i overpaid which yeah i, I mean i could have um it didn't it didn't matter as much i'm not i don't do anything for the short term my my portfolio in real estate my portfolio in the market my 401k all that stuff i am thinking about it long term so i don't care i'm focused you know i know this is an expensive market i'm focused on appreciation the cash flow here isn't is not amazing it's not enough to retire off of unless i get quite a few properties but I know, you know, that house that I paid 501 for is now worth about 700. So, wow. you know, and that's just in three years. So it's like, I knew that going into it. And I was like, okay, if I got to overpay a little bit, you know, this isn't, and people do need to do the math too. Like by then you're probably talking to a lender and they can tell you like, it's, it's not a crazy difference in your mortgage. If it, if, you know, it's, it's a couple grand over or even 25 over, it wasn't like a night and day difference, you know? So that's just math too. It's just like, okay, can I afford this for a couple, you know, 200 extra a month or something or 300 extra? Like, and if you can, then yeah, you, you know, you got to kind of, kind of know there. So I, I guess one, one point I want to make, and I, I totally agree with you, Dan, but w what a lot of, a lot of new investors make the mistake of confusing purchase price with the actual value of the property, right? Because those are two separate things. I could list a, a million dollar property for $300,000 and say you buy it for $400,000, you win $100,000 over asking, but it's a million dollar property. Was that a bad buy? Absolutely not. And the inverse is true as well, where I could list a, a $200,000 property for a million bucks and someone might buy it for six. Is that a good deal because they got a $400,000 discount on the purchase price? Absolutely not because the property is only worth 200. So as a real estate investor, at times you have to separate, I think, uh, your emotion from the purchase price and instead fall back on your numbers. Like what is the purchase price that makes this specific deal meet my investment criteria? What is the purchase price that allows me to get the re return or, or appreciation or tax benefit or whatever my goals are? What is the purchase price I need to be at to achieve those goals? So as a, as a Ricky, if you can separate separate your emotion from the purchase price and instead focus on your numbers, it's an easier way to make decisions about investing. So Dan, now that you've got this property, you moved into it, was it vacant when you purchased it? Yes. So um, the downstairs was actually um, had been vacant for a while. I don't think anyone had lived in it for a while. And the upstairs was an older woman who was actually moving out to a nursing home anyway. She'd been in there for like 18 years and wow. been paying like oh. nothing. So <laughs> we didn't even get to see it. Also too, unfortunately, because of COVID, she could she could technically not let us in. So, you know, luckily I had a, a, an agent I trusted, like I said, and, and he made sure that he put in the clause that like, we will not actually close on this house until we get in upstairs at one point. So, you know, like, and they, and they like tried to call the cops and like force us to let us in, but it wasn't happening. So luckily she was moving out like relatively around the same time anyway. So we just had to wait, like, you know, it delayed it a little bit, like two or three weeks. And we had to wait until she got out so we could actually go upstairs and see. And of course I was like, okay, like, what is this going to be like? This could be the worst ever, but we still had that option <laughs> to pull out even if it was. So they knew that. So yeah, it was completely vacant, which is awesome. We knew we were going to live in the bottom floor, rent the upstairs, but um, it did need a lot. It was definitely a light fixer upper for sure.
So did you guys move in and then how long did it take to kind of do that rehab? Did you guys do it yourself? Did you hire contractors? The rehab was, luckily there was nothing like major, major, um, except for some water issues, which we can talk about, but, um, it was mainly cosmetic. So I'm talking like, it, like it needed new kitchens. It needed new bathrooms. Every single thing needed to be painted every single thing. Uh, you know, like nothing, nothing crazy. So, but it was still very expensive. And especially up here too, like it's crazy how much, you know, you can spend on, on, on basic stuff. Like I was not doing like, I was doing Home Depot, like cabinets and stuff. I was not doing custom made, like anything like that. And it was still a very, very costly renovation, but we knew that and we wanted that. We were, we were looking for that. Like where as my wife definitely had a hard time getting past that. Cause we also saw a lot of turnkey, like duplexes and stuff, but we'd be paying top dollar and, and I was really, and I tell people this all the time too, like really focus on like, you know, how you can, how you can add value to it as, as quick as possible. So that when it does come time to refinance, like you're just, you're just already like, you're, you're so much closer than when you were because we were putting down three and a half percent. So we didn't have a lot of equity. Um, so it did take, uh, about $50,000 to completely renovate it. And, um, you know, but that it got it to that point where my wife was like, wow, like a a bathtub that I'm the first person using it. Like that's insane. Like we were coming from (laughs) a old duplex in Boston that was not glamorous by any means. It was a good deal for rental, you know, in terms of price, but it was like, I mean, it had tie every, I don't know why everyone tiles the ceiling in, in Boston. So if you go to these old places, like tile floor, wall, ceiling, yellow, blues greens not normal colors like just it's the weirdest thing like and that's crazy i don't i don't think i've ever seen tile on the ceiling in like a residential uh property before that's crazy Yeah, it's like pretty common like people i don't know if it was like cheap back then so people thought like these are also bathrooms that like don't get renovated ever but i don't know if people were like wow this tile's so cheap like let's stick it everywhere we can (laughs) let's (laughs) let's put it everywhere literally but you got you got tile in the closets yeah so yeah um well, one question for me, Dan. So you said the renovation was fifty thousand dollars. How did you how did you fund that? Was that out of pocket? Did you have an additional loan? Did you have a partner to bring that? Like, how did you guys fund the fifty thousand dollars? Yeah, so it was definitely a mix of everything. So the uh, you know when I when I came back to Boston, I went to grad school in Georgia. I came back to Boston. I knew I wanted a house hack as soon as possible. I saved as much as I could. I got as many side hustles as I could. Focused on that, knew that I would only be able to cover that three and a half percent down for sure, um, between my wife and I. Um, which luckily on like that's the thing that people don't get is like when something's five hundred thousand dollars, three and a half percent is is less than twenty K. I think it's like seventeen thousand or something. Like that's not terrible to save. You know, a hundred and twenty thousand or a hundred thousand is rough. But so we did that, you know, grind in there for a couple months, and then I actually got um a small a small portion of my, my dad's life insurance, my mom gave to me, um, to do the renovations and stuff. So that was honestly, you know, 100% the thing that really like got, got me going there. And, and I know, you know, there are plenty of people that kind of discredit that and everything. But, um, for me, it's all about like, just don't waste any opportunity you get. So, you know, for me, yes, I knew that that 50 K was a blessing and anyone would be lucky to have it. Like I would have easily given it back a million times over for my dad, but this was something I was not going to waste. And I knew he always wanted to do in real estate. So like, I was, I loved it. I was like, this is like much, much better for me to really like get, you know, get in essentially. So this is actually a huge pet peeve of mine is how you said that like people may discredit it because you got that money from the life insurance. I can't stand when people do that. It's like, oh, this person inherited this money or this person, you know, their parents were really well off, gave them this money or whatever that opportunity is that they took advantage of. How many people are out there that get those same opportunities, get a hold of that same money and just blow it? I almost Mm -hmm. think sometimes it's harder when you come into money like that so easily that It's way easier to just blow it and not use it where your hard earned money, you've had to scrape and save forever. Like it's easier to go and use that for, you know, to build your future or whatever. But, um, yeah, so definitely don't discredit yourself because I think there are probably a lot more people who 
get these kind of opportunities and they don't take advantage of it by investing or using it to kind of build their future for sure. I mean, what's the, isn't it like the statistic is like wealth is gone by like the third generation or, or something crazy like that. Like yeah. most people can't handle wealth that's passed down to them. Yeah. Yeah. I also want to touch on the, the side hustle piece, Dan, because you, you said you, you kind of side hustled your way into saving up for that down payment. Um, we, we had an entire show on side hustles. It was, um, gosh, I, I can't remember the episode number. Maybe our, our producers can help us out here, but, um, what, what were the side hustles that, that you worked on Dan or that you leveraged to save up that, that three and a half percent? Yeah. So, I mean, I've definitely been a bit of a serial side hustler. I have tried everything. DoorDash, Uber Eats, uh, building stuff, uh, literally selling stuff, like whatever I get my hands on. Like I did retail, like I worked at Banana Republic for a while, which wasn't fun. Like literally like <laughs> I, I've tried it all. Um, and I never really stopped. So when I graduated, when I graduated undergrad, um, you know, my first job was $38,000 a year in Boston. And I was living with my, my, my girl, uh, who, you know, was making like I think 60 maybe then or whatever. So she wanted a little bit bougier of an apartment. She was like, she didn't understand that like literally like, you know, like we're young, we should just be spending it all anyway. But me trying to keep up with that, you know, making 38 K a year in an apartment that it was like 1100 for each of us. I was like, it's so hard. Like I was like, all right, dude, you got to do something like you got you. It doesn't matter. Like this can't be your only job. So, and then I went back to grad school and luckily got like, you know, a raise and stuff. But I've tried it all. Honestly, the one that has really stuck with me um, is called TaskRabbit. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with it or not. It's not in everywhere. Yeah, we don't have it in Buffalo, but I've heard a lot of people talk about it because I've looked to see and yeah, we don't have it yet. So for me, like I like to try to like, and this goes back to like my problem with just like working harder and not smarter. Like I like have been doing TaskRabbit for a couple of years I'm finally at the point where I'm like actually retiring from my clients, even though I should have done it already. I should have done it probably two years ago. Like I, it served its purpose and now I'm just dragging it on, but it's, it has been super beneficial. And I like, I definitely encourage people to think of like what stage of side hustling they're in. Like, are they like in the, I need cash now or I need it in a month or I need it in a year. And that, because you know, like I do regret spending so much time, doing that and like yeah sure i can go out and make 50 bucks tonight but like it's not scalable i'm trading my time for money i'm doing awful stuff mowing lawns like moving moving furniture doing doing essentially whatever i've had some pretty pretty interesting tasks on it but um you know it's like that one has definitely uh been enough to really that also helped too we got it we did get into a little debt when we got the house um the first one and that helped us really you know, kind of get out of it. So I do essentially like, owe it a thanks, but I definitely think it's time to retire and focus on stuff that's a little <laughs> more like AI enjoy and scalable. So, so, uh, our episode was 294 where we interviewed, uh, two of our previous guests who came back for a second episode to talk about th- how they side hustled their ways, uh, into some of their deals. But, uh, Dan, just really quickly, what, what is task rabbit maybe for those that aren't familiar and just like ballpark, how much, how much would you say someone could, project to earn on like a monthly basis using task rabbit as a side hustle yeah so task rabbit i will say is great for the i need cash right now stage and i recommend it if it's in your area and you're comfortable um i totally recommend it over like a uber eats or doordash or something but essentially what it is is it's kind of like a handyman app and i say that and i definitely don't want like women to get discouraged or anything because there's so many tasks on it that like it it you can do anything. Like if you feel comfortable with it, whatever. If you want to mow a lawn, cool. If you want to, they have literally mowing, moving, getting rid of stuff, cleaning, organizing. They have rental property management, which I've never actually been picked up for, but I am open for it. Like they have a list, a a pretty big list of essentially anything you could do. So if you feel comfortable, like going to these people's houses, doing whatever, like, you know, and, and you set your own hours, you set your own pay, Um, so I do think it's great. Like, you know, I've done it for like three years and, you know, for me, it's, it's always been after my nine to five. So doing it nights and weekends, um, I've probably made about $12,000 doing it. Um, and honestly could have realistically made more. Like I started off being a little too obsessive with it. Like I, like the first month I made like 
$1,600 or something. Cause I was just like, I'm going to fill up every hour I possibly can, but you're trading time for money. You're working your butt off for sure. You're not doing, you're, you're literally doing stuff that no one wants to do like build Ikea furniture and stuff. So that's why you're getting hired all the time, super easily. And then the clients realistically, like once they know you're like pretty much that like guy or person who will just like do, you know, help with this or that or whatever, they just essentially kind of keep you like, you know, your number there. And like, so I built kind of a small list of clients that keep me busy enough and stayed off the app for the past probably two years. Dan, we had um, Honey Money Rachel on an episode and she actually talked about how she uses it when she furnishes her short-term rentals to put all the furniture together. That she found a great guy off task <laughs> that goes to do does all these little things for her when she puts together her short term rentals. Yeah, I actually just opened up the app just to kind of see what 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 are the options. So um, you can get help moving, general mounting, TV mounting, furniture assembly, furniture removal, minor home repairs, yard work, indoor painting, cleaning, plumbing, errands, light carpentry, packing and unpacking, organization even personal assistant work. So th there's a lot of different things you can do in TaskRabbit. So yeah. it's, I just want to highlight there because I, I think a lot of folks are, are in the boat of like, man, I, I just need to hustle up some extra cash to get this, this first deal done. And there are so many options out there, guys, like so many options yeah. out there. So do what Dan did, find a side hustle, grind it out after work weekends. And there's no excuse not to save up, you know, what was it? 17, five is what you had to say for that first deal. Yeah. You guys can make it work. Yeah. And I also know that I, I follow Rachel on um, Instagram and I know that at one point she literally hired someone off task rabbit and then like, kind of like mentored them. Like they were like, Oh, I'll, I'll help you. Like I'll help you. I think it was like bushes or something. Like if you kind of like help me, like talk me through like, uh, you know, how you buy all these houses and stuff. And I've done, I've tried to do the same thing with clients. Like I've literally, like I have a client who I work for like his whole family, like, and he's got some rental properties in the area. So I've definitely built up the relationship to be like, you know, it, just so you know, I'm an agent. Like I am an investor. Like I want to buy more properties. If you ever want to dump off any of these, like shoot me a text, like happy to talk. So it does also help to like to build those connections. So do you want to tell us real quick about your second property? that you got and just kind of run through that. Yeah, absolutely. So the second one was uh, a duplex, which was essentially two streets over. And um, it was a four bed, two bath is the unit I'm actually in. And the first floor is a two bed, one bath. Um, so that one was, you know, we purchased that last September. So this is, you lived in the first one for a year. Yeah. Uh, that year occupancy. We lived in it for closer to two. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I will say too, like obviously being in an expensive area and something I've definitely struggled with is like just the like comparison, like, you know, you go out there and you see everyone else buying like a million properties or like people telling you should house hack every like year, or, like on the dot and stuff. And it was really hard for us. Like we couldn't, I couldn't save that fast. Like I couldn't, I just couldn't save what we needed for the prices continuing to go up. Um, you know, and it was like, it wasn't, it wasn't in the cards. So it took us like a year and a half or something. Um, but it worked out very well because this house, which I had at first written off and it was my agent who kind of came back and said like, do you know, like this is literally like two streets over to you. Like your life would be much easier. And I was like, you're totally right. Like I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna self-manage these. I was like, why am I not thinking of that? And we wanted a bigger place anyway. And this was, this is definitely bigger. And it was like, okay, like we weren't as obsessed with the second one as like kind of the best deal possible. We really were like, we want the next one to be like five years. Like we want to, we want to start a family in this house. We want to be comfortable. Like, and that's the thing too. Like, again, it's as much as you want it to be, you don't need to be, you know, so gung ho on, I need a $500,000 a month in cash flow. What if you just want to live in this area? Like I can't afford this area right now with a single family, four bed, two bath. I'm in a four bed, two bath right now. So, you know, why not? Okay, so you moved into that one and now you have, did, was that one vacant too? And did you have to do any rehab with it? Yeah, yeah. So unfortunately where I live, like both of our properties are actually 1940, which is like babies compared to the rest of Boston and the area. Um, everything was born like when 
like the British were invading. Like it's crazy how everything is, <laughs> is so old here. Tony just can't even imagine houses like yeah, that. My, <laughs> my whole neighborhood didn't even exist until like 2017. Oh <laughs> man, you can't even like the stuff you see, like the basements, like it's straight out of horror movies. But literally, like this, um, this one was 1940. But it still needed some definitely, again, cosmetic. But unfortunately, it was bigger. So it was like, okay, it needed a little more. Um, but they had actually, the previous owners had done a little bit more. So like our first one, like it it was like smaller, but it needed like every little thing. This one, we didn't have to paint every single room. We had to paint most of them, but not every single room. So it was like, yeah, it definitely needed some love. Um, and that was like 55000 um, so we're right around the same and I use the same contractor, built a good relationship with him. My wife and I try to DIY everything we can. Like last summer, I, you know, replaced the deck boards. Like we did that together at my first one, like, you know, paint what we can. Like we, we try to do what we can to save. Um, tried to give my like upstairs bathroom a little, little more love um you know we ran out of money to like do the tiling and in the you know in the shower and all that but i was like all right let me see how i can actually kind of make this a very nice place to live on a bit more of a diy budget so so dan before we kind of wrap up here what are your best tips for people who want to start house hacking I'm going to make the assumption, I could absolutely be wrong, but I'm going to make the assumption that most people like, you know, listening to this want to start house hacking are relatively new um, and younger, like maybe in their mid twenties, you know, early twenties or whatever, which likely means that they probably need some help, you know, financially. So I definitely think that side hustle, I think do it, do it, do it as smart as you can though. Um, You know, ask yourself, like I said, do I need cash now, next month or in a year? Um, and really focus on on what's going to be best for you. And for me, I just need the money immediately. So I found the one that could get me the most immediately. Don't mess around there. Like definitely spend some time researching that. And then, but obviously know when to get out. Um, and then really, you got to be a pro at analyzing these deals. And I really tell people, so, you know, I'm an agent now and I, and I, I primarily like to help people, you know, house hack. But I tell them like, try to analyze like a hundred deals before you even talk to an agent. You know, because it's so easy, like everyone wants help, you know, house hacking and stuff. And then like you guys were saying before, like there's a chance they never, ever do it. So, you know, you got to kind of like, I think that gets you serious. I think that sets those realistic expectations and, you know, helps you build kind of a buy box. And I think that'll just, you know, once you do talk to an agent, you're going to look serious. You're going to be like, I know this, I know the area, I know, you know, help me get to that finish line, help me kind of, you know, tweak some things, but you know, really focus on that. And then that's super important. You know, that plays into you really needing to work with someone who understands house hacking, you know, that I I tell people, you know, interview three to five agents, um, you know, and I don't tell people like, if I talk to someone, I say, you know, go out, go out, talk to other people. Like you need to see what else is out there. You need to know, you know, what realistically, um, type of relationship and vibe you have with someone. And like, there's just, you know, there's so many options out there. It's a little challenging. So definitely kind of build that up and then, you know, leverage your W2 as much as you can. Um, Like I said, I'm not trying to escape the rat race tomorrow. My goal has always been by 40 to reach financial independence, but just to have options. If I still like my W2, Mm -hmm. I'm still going to ride that out. I don't care. Like literally I just want the options. So I'm setting that goal. I'm setting it not close enough that I have to just sprint, but, you know, enough to like build the momentum. So ask yourself, how can you leverage that? Like, how can you, how can you make those connections there? So Dan, what a, what a great way to, to, to wrap your story there, man. I, I think that's a nice little bow to, to put on it and perspective, I think for a lot of rookies that are, that are listening. So uh, I want to take us into our next segment here, which is the rookie request line. And for all of our rookies that are listening, if you like your question featured on the show, head over to biggerpockets.com slash reply. And we just might use your question for the show. So today's question comes from Mel Sims and Mel Sims, would an umbrella policy be beneficial or necessary if I were to house hack a multifamily or a single family home? Or is an umbrella policy mainly used for investments where you are not a resident? So uh, I guess the, the, you know, to add on another piece of the question there, Dan, I guess, how are you uh, protecting yourself from a liability perspective with, with your house hacks? Yeah. So I will, I will say for sure. Uh, I, I haven't, I, probably will eventually, but I'm not in an LLC yet. Uh, both of them are in me and my wife's name. 
Um, you know, and, and that being said, yes, I did get, I did bundle up on the insurance as much as possible. So I do have an umbrella policy. Um, I had it when I was living in the first house, still have it, have it living in the second house. I personally think that, you know, obviously there's loopholes either way. If someone's really determined or figures out the right way to get to you, they, they realistically probably will be able to. But I definitely think that, yeah, having that umbrella policy is is pretty crucial. I know mine's for like, I think a million dollars or something. Um, you know, and that just, it's just, it's really not that much extra. Like, I don't really know, like my insurance is, I think it's relatively cheap. So I'm, I'm not like overly <laughs> concerned about it there. So I recommend it personally. I know some people may be a little like, eh, like, but I recommend it. On my personal assets, like my primary house and even our vehicles that are in our personal name that aren't used at all as investments, we still have an umbrella policy that covers those personal assets and anything that's in our personal name. All right, let's go to our rookie exam. So Dan, these are the three most important questions you'll ever be asked in your life. Are you ready for question number one? Absolutely, let's go. <laughs> All right, man. So what is one actionable thing rookie should do after listening to your episode? I think they should, if house hacking is the route that they're going, find five markets that they are potentially interested around them. And I don't mean Georgia, California, New York, Massachusetts. I mean five towns around them that they could potentially, not not meaning this is it and over with, that they could potentially house hack in. Start with that. Try to find those those areas. What is one tool, software, or app that you use in your business? Um, I love Rentcast. I definitely am at the point where uh, it, it's it's hard because when you're beginning in house hacking, real estate investing in general, like... There's so many things you can spend money on and it can add up really quickly. For me, I like Rentcast because although I'm not going to claim it's like 100% accurate, but I have found at least in my area, I haven't pressure tested it. I, I did pressure test it a little bit more to an, uh, an out-of-state area, but I found it to be pretty accurate and free. Um, so basically when you're when you're running, doing that a hundred houses, I said to, you know, a hundred house hacks, I said to analyze, you're going to need to know the rents. And after a while you will become a pro. Like I can, I just know the rent for a three bed, you know, two bath in my area or whatever, but you know, you're definitely going to need to start off like kind of plugging in, looking at Zillow and all that stuff. And you can totally look at Zillow and do like the market research route, or you can use rent cast, which is free. Um, you know, I do like that one. You could get a little more uh, accurate and do like rentometer, which I know you pay for, but I've just been doing rent cast. I think once you get to the mm. agent side, they'll help you figure out the exact price. Yeah, that's interesting. I've never heard of that one before. So yeah, awesome I was going to ask you, Ash. Yeah, rent cast. It's a new one. All right. Question number three. Where do you plan on being five years from now, Dan? Five years from now? I mean, I, I, so I just turned 30, uh, la two weeks ago. And I, like I said, I've always been shooting for 40 as my, you know, my five target. I got it written next to me on my whiteboard. Like that's always my goal. So I've been trying lately to figure out what the heck like the next 10 years look like. And it's, it's been a struggle because there's so many options, but for me, five years, I want to hopefully continue to grow in my W2 because I like it, but I want to move from that, that side hustle stage that I talked about where I don't need cash right now. I want to build a business. I want to build a brand. I want to, you know, uh, generate revenue as an agent and really focus on helping people house hack. I'm obviously biased towards that way, but just focus on that and like build that as a brand as one. So I really like to continue to focus on that and hopefully help as many people there, especially people who think that you can't do it in, in expensive markets. Now you're, you're lighting the way for people uh, like myself. I live in California, you know, another super expensive market. So it, it's never about like, can I invest in this market? The question is always what strategy makes the most sense to invest in this market. And that's, that's kind of how you go about it. Um, all right, man, I, I want to finish things up by giving a highlight or a shout out to this week's Ricky Rockstar. And if you guys want to be highlighted as a Ricky Rockstar, get active in the Real Estate Rookie Facebook group, get active in the Bigger Pockets forums, uh, leave us a review on the podcast. Those are all places that we go uh, to pull these Ricky Rockstar. So this week's Rockstar is Jamie Joseph. And Jamie says, we just closed on our second property using the house hacking strategy, bringing us to four doors. They started this journey back in September of 21, and they're super grateful for the BP community and all the resources like the books, the podcasts, and the forums, because it's given them a wealth of knowledge to invest and create generational wealth. So Jamie, congrats to you on uh, this newest house hack. 
Well, Dan, thank you so much for joining us on today's Real Estate Rookie Podcast. Can you let everyone know where they can reach out to you and find out some more information about you? Yeah, thank you guys so much. Um, most active on Instagram, uh, House Hack and Hustle is my um, username there. Um, also, that's the website too, if you want to go to househackandhustle.com. But yeah, definitely just feel free to shoot me a DM or whatever. Love connecting with people and um, yeah, spreading the good word of house hacking. Well, for everyone listening, if you think that you have an amazing story to share and you want to tell everyone how to become a real estate investor and how you did it, you can go to biggerpockets.com slash guest and fill out our guest form to be a guest on an episode. I'm Ashley at Wealth from Rentals and he's Tony at Tony J. Robinson on Instagram. And we will be back with a rookie reply. Still, yeah.